And a very good afternoon, a very warm welcome. It's Thursday and it's uh, Deering Live at the usual time. How are we doing, young Dave? Hey, I'm doing well. Doing all right? Good to, good to be here. Good to be here two weeks in a row. I two know. A row. We're on a roll. I know. We should probably keep this momentum going, don't you think? Yeah, what should we do next week? <sighs> nice segue. I enjoyed that. I'm not even going <laughs> to pretend like I didn't enjoy that. That was fantastic. Uh, all right, so before we get into the, today's guests, uh, who we're very excited to hear and, uh, and hang with for a little bit, um, we are ever so excited to announce that for the second year of running, uh, Deering Live has been asked to host the Steve Martin Banjo Prize uh, for 2022. Now, if you hang to the end of the show, I'll tell you the winners. That's my incentive. Oh, look at that yeah. little teaser there. That little teaser? But no, I won't really. So I hope, uh, hope nobody, nobody from that camp is watching. But yeah, so next week, uh, Thursday at the slightly later time of 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, um, and some unearthly time in the morning in the UK and Europe, uh, we will be live with the Steve Martin Banjo Prize for the second year. So we're very, very excited about that. So stay tuned. Yeah. But... That is not why we're here. It's just a good opportunity to talk about it and announce it. Today, we have two very cool guests. Um, we welcome multi-instrumentalist and multilingual duo, Larry and Joe. Larry hails from Mongus, Venezuela, and is a legend of Llanera music, while the North Carolina-based Joe Troop is a Grammy-nominated bluegrass and old-time musician. Now, as a duo, Larry and Joe are based in North Carolina, um, and they're on a mission to show that music has no borders. Uh, they're performing a fusion of Venezuelan and Appalachian folk music on the harp, the cuatro, the banjo, the fiddle, maracas, uh, guitar, bass, and many others. So if you caught the episode last week with Mark Schatz, you would have heard him at the very end of that show when we announced uh, Larry and Joe today um, that uh, he gave a seal of approval by saying simply, those guys are amazing. And I think we can agree with them based on the sound check, right? It was cool. Yeah. And you saw them at Blue Ridge, right? I, that... I saw them at the Blue Ridge camp, Blue Ridge Banjo Camp, Bellafoot Camp, and uh, it was it was really good. Yeah, really? <laughs> so I'm All excited. Right. Yeah, awesome. Let's bring them in. Let's bring in Larry and Joe. Say hi, Larry and Joe. How are we doing? Doing great. Yay! Awesome. Really, really happy to have you guys here. Very excited to uh, for the show and to hear uh, hear what's going on with you guys. But first, let's see if we can get into a a little song. Um, Great. Kick us off yeah. with a tune. Yeah, we're gonna do one called Gabanjo. Gabanjo. Let's go. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. 
Fantastic, fantastic. It's, it's, I, I love it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm down here in your old stomping ground. Um, I'm in Buenos Aires right now. And uh, you, you spent how many y years? Buenos Aires, querido. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what brought you down to Buenos Aires a long time ago? You were here for a while, right? 10 years, yeah. 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 And what well, did you what initially brought you down here? Well, I uh, had a bunch of Argentinian friends that I'd met while living in Spain for a couple of years. And uh, I just, I went down for a visit and I ended up staying for a decade. I, I just really, uh, I really liked it. And uh, it was a good place for me for that period of time. Yeah. And then what was, um, you, you know, you, you formed a band that was, that was successful down here and, and, um, was it how was it kind of finding playing the banjo down in buenos aires and playing playing appalachian music because you play other instruments as well um but playing that kind of bringing that kind of music down here yeah well it was a complete novelty uh actually as soon as i got down there i, I found the best banjo player in argentina at that time uh who's a tremendous bassist a double bassist named diego sanchez and I met Diego, you know, I think I even communicated him with him through YouTube a couple weeks before I went. And then we met up and we formed a duo uh, pretty quickly. And uh, he liked the banjo, but most people have never, you know, never heard of the banjo. Uh, it has gotten a little bit more popular. Some of my students actually started a bluegrass festival down there called Buenos Aires Bluegrass. And uh, it's happening uh, November 6th, this Saturday. You might want to check that out, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, make sure to just check up, you know, Buenos Aires Bluegrass. It's a festival sponsored by the city. Uh, they have some underwriting. So, uh, you know, th I was there at the beginning of what has turned into a small subculture of Appalachian string band folk music enthusiasts. Yeah, it's and, interesting. Yeah, right? At the time, it was completely cool. unknown, you know. Yeah, yeah. You kind of started to help start this little scene that's kind of going on here, right? I, I mean, I, I don't, I, things start themselves. I, I've always noticed that like energetic fields sort of emerge, um, you know, simultaneously. And then, then they kind of like amalgamate at some point. So I, I can't take credit for everything. That's everyone sure. else's work. But sure. yeah, I was, I definitely uh, was able to do a lot of teaching uh, banjo and I, you know, I taught a whole, I mean, if you go to that festival, a whole slew of the people there 
yeah, if not yeah. a sizable, you know, maybe half the people in that festival, I, I had something to do with teaching them <laughs> right. at one point. That, I mean, that's all, that's what I was doing in Buenos Aires for a yeah. decade, you know, playing around in the underground music scene, and teaching banjo and fiddle and mandolin and guitar and, you know, the bluegrass stuff. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, you're back in the States now and, and you talked how things just kind of, things just kind of can just kind of happen. Like, how did you, let's talk about you, you know, you and Larry, how did this happen? How did you two get together? Uh, Larry and I met in December of last year. I was offered a residence at a, a music venue in town, kind of like a cultural space, the coolest cultural space there is, in my opinion, in the country. Uh, it's called The Fruit. This, this place is awesome. It's one of a kind. It's something you would expect to see in Buenos Aires. It reminds me of Hasta Trilce, which is this beautiful um, theater and, and uh, Masa 177, Hasta Trilce. It's like a theater, bar, foyer. It's this multi-space. Anyway, um, The Fruit is a multi-space in Durham. Um, and I was offered a residency there to kind of rehearse, uh, curate the space to my liking for an entire month. And uh, I met uh, Larry. I, I, I heard about his whereabouts from a mutual friend. I got in contact with him. I saw some videos that they had posted uh, that he had posted of himself playing harp, and I thought, no way! Like I've got to play music with this guy uh, because I love Yanera music. I've been listening to Yanera music since I was, you know, a teenager, but I was never able to be under a master's tutelage. So I contacted Larry, and I invited him to the series. The first night he came, he brought his bass and his harp. And uh, the audience was spe so spellbound, they immediately gave uh, us a standing ovation. We had never played music together, but the connection was like fireworks. And, uh, and since then, we've just been, um, we've been, I, I officially moved to Durham in March. I was on the road January and February of this year with a theater company. I came to town in March and we started working and we've already got an album in the can. And, uh, it's, and actually, the single first single drops tomorrow. Uh, oh wow! In the vehicle, which is the last song we're going to play tonight. That'll be on available and all the usual, you know. Yeah, online. all those whatever. Cool. Come Frangle, streaming, which <laughs> uh, stuff. Well, can why don't um, maybe this is a better question for Larry? Maybe, um, can you explain what what Yanera music? is like what what make what's the essence of this music Larry tú puedes explicar lo que es la música la eh, llanera y cuál es la esencia de tal música La música llanera es la música representativa de Venezuela Llanera music is the representative music of Venezuela Es um, se hace con cuerdas instrumentos de cuerda It's done with strings music Se puede correr el, el, el arpa para aquel lado ahí va Sorry Okay. I just noticed Larry's been talking through strings the whole yeah. time. <laughs> That's no. right. Yeah, it's better to see his face. Se hace con cuerdas y lleva el acompañamiento de las maracas, que es percusión menor. So it's a string band tradition, but there is a minor percussive element, which is the maracas. Y la esencia de nuestra música, uh, básicamente, o lo que se ha conocido, es que nos trae... Venimos desde la colonización por la música andaluz de España. Por allí entra un poco lo que es parecido a la música de Venezuela hoy en día. And to talk about the essence of uh, our music, you've got to talk about the colonial period um, in which a lot of and Andalusian, Andalusia, uh, immigrants from and Andalusia, southern Spain, uh, came to Venezuela and brought their sound with them. Como también se hace con cuerdas uh, de metal, porque se toca música a uh, lo que llamamos en Venezuela música oriental, que es tocada con mandolina. Uh, then you also have to consider the uh, metal strings, like he's playing nylon strings. That's Llanera tradition is from the Plains region of uh, Eastern Venezuela, sorry, Western Venezuela, which has shared this uh, Llanera music tradition from the Plains region, which is called el Llano. Is shared between Colombia and Venezuela, where he's from. He's from the Oriente, which is the eastern part of the country, and they use uh, metal strings. And uh, yeah, we had dicho mandolina, no? Mandolina. And there, there's a uh, mandolin tradition there. Uh, we're gonna do a piece 
uh, at some point tonight uh, that showcases kind of the, the sort of music that, they're, that they explore in that tradition, which is completely different than Musica Llanera. Eh, ¿Algo más de la esencia de la Musica Llanera? Sí. Uh, nuestra Musica Llanera eh, como esencia toma el canto hecho en medio de, como dice la palabra llanera, en medio del llano, en medio de la sabana. Yeah, one thing about our tradition is that it takes, uh, it, it stems from singing in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nothing, in the plains. It's like the Pampa region of mm -hmm. Argentina, or the prairie, or, I, or more like the high plains, you know, like yeah. North Dakota. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, And Joe, what did you, was it about this music that you thought you could bring a, you know, traditional Appalachian instrumentation to this music and, and add something to it? Well, I just thought it would sound cool on the banjo. And when we started exploring uh, this music, like what we, what the first song we did is, it's called Gabanjo, but it's actually a Gaban, um, G-A-V-A-N. Uh, but you know the V in Spanish is pronounced like a B. It's labial, so gaban. Mm -hmm. um, and gabanjo is like a little funny thing for Venezuelans. They'd be like ah, a gaban on the banjo, you know. And uh, English people would be like, "What's that?" But uh, anyhow, uh, I just thought, yeah, I'll give this a try. I'll start picking picking out the harp vocabulary and the cuatro vocabulary on the banjo, and then some of this instrument called the bandola, which is like a pear shaped guitar a four string uh, guitar family instrument that's very cool with a very aggressive uh, atta uh, attack and it sounds like pingy. Larry noticed the similarities between the sound of the bandola and the banjo. So we're the, what I'm doing as a banjo player incorporates some of like what I was just doing. That's cuadro technique, but I'm not using the index finger, which they use. I don't, I have picks on that finger. So of course, if I do mm -hmm. that, I get you know, stuck to the string. Yeah. So. I'm using downstrokes with a uh, in the uh, with a uh, pinky and ring because they're the unpicked. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Like I'm still trying to get used to that kind of up, up, right. up stop, which is like with the nail. This is all cuatro technique. Then some of the picking stuff that I was doing. Yeah, here's I'm emulating that, but um, so it's like. So they gotta. So I have a good teacher, right? So I'm doing that. Yeah. And this is like a. This is straight out of the. So. I'm doing. It's all thumb. Mostly downstroke, so you try to. There's this one index that comes up anyway, so there's a lot of downstroke. Like that phrase would just be all downstroke with the thumb. That's bandola. And uh -huh. then a lot of the vocabulary that I'm using is, you know, like. Uh, like... what the right hand and the harp is doing so it works out perfectly on the banjo to do the harp phrases it you, you can do the cuatro phrases on it and then I'm, it, you can really dig it with down stroke on thumb and kind of create a bandola vibe so what's really interesting as a banjo player is that venezuelans are hearing this and verdad mano que algunos han preguntado de que re región de venezuela es ese instrumento Some of Venezuelan uh, folk <laughs> musicians have asked what region of Venezuela the banjo was from. Because it sounds like it should be a traditional instrument from Venezuela. So it's the first time in my experience as a banjo player that people have actually gravitated towards the instrument. It's completely, it has no stigma at right. all. Virtually right. unknown in Venezuela. And people are just like, that sounds great. Uh, there's a lot of uh, aperture. Venezuela is a very open-minded musical place. Um, there's a lot, go there's just so much going on in Venezuelan folk music. It's, um, it's uncanny uh, how much diverse music they have. 
Uh, so uh, I think the banjo is starting. There's even a young man in Merida, Venezuela, who ha is starting to play Yanera music on the banjo because he saw the banjo and he thought it was cool. So I think oh. there's a like I think there's a propensity for just incorporation, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, in 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 their musical culture. Uh, ask Larry, you know, what does what do you think it is about the musical culture that keeps them so open minded? Where you know, ¿Qué es lo que le hace, eh, ¿qué es lo que hace que sea tan abierta de mente la cultura musical de Venezuela? Que se expandió eh, por, todo el, por todo el territorio, por toda Venezuela, y se regó hacia Colombia. Y los músicos que tocaban otros, digamos, otros folclores, comenzaron a mezclar música de otras regiones con la música venezolana. So, yeah, la música llanera, perdón. So the música llanera music has somewhat it was it was once defined to the llano, which is mm -hmm. the plains region, but it is spread through the whole country like Larry like I said it it's as if like somebody from California was playing bluegrass. Mm -hmm. Nowadays that's a very normal thing, but at a certain time that was not right. that common. Well, same thing happened in Venezuela and he's the result of that. He's like a Stuart Duncan like figure or something <laughs> like <laughs> Yanera music because he's really, really good and known, but he's not from the Llano. And uh, you'll find uh, Yanera musicians in Caracas and in, in, in all, all, all different places. Anyway, what uh, people have done is they've incorporated this music, they've used it, and they brought other styles to it. So now contemporary Yanera music is like. It, 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 it can be anything, you know. There's a tradition, but then they've also expanded upon it. And I, I just think that um, as the the communication within the country uh, grew and there was more accessibility to this music, like Simon Diaz popularized the Amena music for the for the Venezuelan uh, people. And you know, in que año empezó a popularizó la música de llanera Simon Diaz tipo años 60, 50, 60 por ahí. Yeah, and then I was like 60. the 19s. There was a folk revival in the 1960s. Another parallel to what happened here in the United States, where all these New Yorkers took bluegrass and they just did it so good. Everyone was thinking, wow, that hillbilly music's incredible. And uh, the same thing happened in like Caracas with uh, música llanera. So people, folk revivalists, started g getting in, in tune with this incredible music that was so culturally rich, and and now it's been spread throughout the whole country. And um, yeah. And is there a modern? <laughs> is there like a modern uh, uh, contemporary version, like the way cumbia has, like in Colombia? Oh yeah, si hay una versión contemporánea de la música llanera. Yeah, yeah, completely, totally. <laughs> there's there's traditionalists, and then there's uh, ¿Cómo se llama el grupo de Nelson en Chandía? Compases. Compases is a, one of our friends. Yes. Well, I've only, I've only <laughs> met him. Is his bassist uh, Nelson Echandia. He's a virtuoso. He actually played on a song on our album. He's a bassist of the Victor Wooten <laughs> school of bass, but he's taken Victor Wooten vibes and put it with like <laughs> traditional Venezuelan and Latin American music. He's wow. a sick musician, and his group Compases. Is a really good example of a C O M B A S E S. Uh, it's a really good contemporary Yanera music representative. Uh, so, like, 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 you know, like Nelson, <laughs> one of his things, he's taken Victor Wooten techniques and, and brought them to Musica Yanera, is what uh, Larry's saying. They're like best friends. So, one of our goals is to get Nelson up here. I get, I get try it, Yeah. <laughs> Sort of is he still in Venezuela or is he in the... He's in Venezuela. Where is he? In Caracas. He's in Caracas, Thanks. capital. And how did you get so into this style of music at a young age? You mentioned in, in when you're a teenager. In you're Spain, into... uh, where I did my undergrad, part of my undergrad, two years, uh, I met, like I said, a group of Argentinians. They were my core group of friends. And they had a an album uh, called Pajarillo Verde, by Cecilia Tov, which was like, she was a Caracas. She's part of that folk revivalist movement. She's a Caraqueña, uh, a city girl, a city woman who made up um, this, who had this very successful album in Argentina. So my Argentinian friends 
gave me this album. En Venezuela, ella no es tan conocida en Venezuela ni siquiera. Es conocida, sí. Pero no, no como no, entre pero llanero, no, músico llanero, no tanto. ¿no? Dentro de la música neta, 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 de, de lo, del llano como tal, no. Porque ella es una canción so, si se quieren dentro de lo venezolano clásico. So there, there, there's a phenomenon that we're looking in globalization uh, that we can identify here. So Cecilia Todd is not, you know, she's, she's regarded as a good musician, but she's not like, uh, she's of no like, um, she's not considered like a, the greatest, uh, you know, Yanera musician at all. She's from Caracas. She's from the city. It's like it's like the guy who did dueling banjos. Was he from New York or something? Like yeah, uh, yeah. you know. Iceberg. And in bluegrass, there's like man, it's a, it's a good melody, but it's not like what what's the what's the fuss, you know? So that there's that kind of vibe with like Pajarillo Verde. The album that I was listening to was part of this folk revivalist movement that came out of Caracas. And it was popularized in major metropolis, metropoli in South America, including Buenos Aires, where my friends came from. So via earlier iterations of globalization, I'm like, I, I noticed my hands like a spider on Larry's head. I got an album and that was my first taste of Musica Llanera, but the songs are uh, from the Llanera tradition and they're, it's a beautiful album. I, I would recommend it. Since then, I've gotten more in touch with the, the people that, you know, the, 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 whole, the people that are from where that music is played. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's that's a whole different entity, you know what I mean? Folk, right, not, yeah. nothing against folk revivalists, but when, when you hear music from, you know, it's from like hearing story. flamenco from Catalonia, when you really want to, you know, you got to know where flamenco, from, you got to hear flamenco from Andalusia, you know what I'm right, saying? Right. Yeah. All the banjo players out there are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple questions here I want to get. Um, Julie Colton is mm -hmm. saying, is asking what's the process for incorporating the banjo into a very traditional musical style? Yeah, uh, inventing techniques and discovering techniques which would um, work better. Like, for example, uh, you know, sort of um, the concept of any finger is fine as long as you play the note is not the case. You need downstroke thumb oriented attack on the banjo uh, in order to kind of get the right punch from this music. So it's mostly I'm using thumb, sometimes index, and very rarely uh, third finger if I'm doing like, uh, you know, group licks of, of, of three. Uh, you know, and then there's techniques like... Uh, that. It, so like... Uh, okay. sounds cool using a splayed index to kind of get this vibe so I've, I've drawn from sort of uh techniques from other instruments blues guitar uh we were produced by a legendary um blues funk and jazz guitarist named charlie hunter and he in the production of our album gave me all these incredible tips which i was able to use to get a better and bigger sound on the instrument like instead of i can't even remember what i like are they it's like there's like i used to do like these i can't even remember how i did it a melodic the melodic thing on banjo that doesn't it doesn't sound hip so yeah. it's like uh that's a, a phrase from a song that we do called uh, it's in bambuco it's called los doce and uh, and like I, I, we just had to like contrast and compare. Charlie's like, okay, do that single string, uh, but yeah. use his thumb and occasionally index, like alternate between thumb and index. So it's more of a single string approach in banjo yeah. terms, and uh, and try to keep downstroke in the four. You can't always do it, obviously, but as much as you can, do it. And like sometimes I'll be playing, you know, like uh, like. Uh, so. Like this, that's like mostly downstroke on thumb as much as you can do it. And when you need the index, use it. So the, to answer the question, like that's, I for you, you, you might have to explore techniques that are considered unorthodox 
on the instrument. And they're not really unorthodox on the banjo because there's a lot of stuff that's probably been explored on banjo we don't even know about. But for the Scruggs style technique or whatever, um, you know, some things haven't been explored by people that play this style. Uh, so I've had to do some research as to how to accommodate, you know, like I said, like the cuatro thing, like, how am I going to get that? Well, with, how am I going to, the first issue is how do I do this without like, uh, throwing my picks off because mm -hmm. you know, I actually, I actually, need, you know, so you got to keep two fingers. Like I have rabbit ears here and I got two fingers kind of curved and then they splay. So it's like, you know, it, it work around problems and just yeah. uh, so that, that that's what I'm currently doing to to try to to try to make this music sound hip on the banjo. And how do you deal with like the psychological like stigma on I think on the banjo it's really strong uh, about you're not playing the banjo correctly sort of thing where you know oh you know, I don't you know I, what I mean, mean though how that kind yeah. of is a pretty strong thing in the banjo world. I mean, you know, like this, I mean. I, mean, I, can, I, I know how to do that, too. That's right. in my bag of tricks, but that's, that bag of tricks is not useful for this music. Yeah. And yeah. like uh, playing the banjo correctly, does that even exist? I don't even think that exists. I don't think there is. It's a relatively unexplored instrument compared to so many other instruments. Right. Like there's not a litany of, uh, there's not like a, uh, a catalog of, uh, I play the violin as well. And that's a whole different. Like uh, it's important to to understand the essence of like scrug style and, and bluegrass. To me, I don't know. I like to play bluegrass music, so yeah. that, that's what I grew up playing. Um, and uh, so that, I just I honestly don't even think of uh, the instrument as I, I don't even conceive of it the same now that I'm a little bit more involved in musica llanera. I, I don't think like I think when I'm playing bluegrass. Um, it's a different concept, which is cool. Because you know you can explore something new, and there is no uh, way to do it correctly because no one, to my knowledge, is doing it except for like that. Eh, ¿Cómo se llama? El chamo eh, Mérida, eh, el, el que toca banjo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Se me fue el nombre. <laughs> Teodoro. Gracias, hermano. <laughs> Teodoro. So Teodoro is down in Merida, and who knows what he's doing on, ba on banjo? He's probably doing it the correct way, you know, because he's in the llano. <laughs> sure. So like, I mean, there's, and also like, you know, at a certain point that you don't have to think about music doesn't have a. Uh, there's not a, you know, we talk about this all the time. La manera correcta de tocar las cosas como ayer en el tienda la tienda de armas. We went to a harp store yesterday, um, and Larry was treated. I mean, they were just kind of like the, the subtext was, oh, um, make sure to wear your mask. They, you know, he was Venezuelan. You know, harp is like there's all these twenty thousand dollar instruments that people are gonna have in their foyer. It's like this classist crap, right. and this guy shreds them all to pieces because he plays to my liking like way, way more than they're like. Oh, I, I don't really like classical harp. I don't give a rat's patoot about it. But that la música clásica en el es muy it's like it's so mm, it's boring yeah it's boring no tiene ni una gota de negritud has no like it has no africa <laughs> it's like the whitest blandest uh insufferable crap uh so in any way i'm kind of I'm not, maybe i'm overboard because they were so racist and like classist to him yesterday and i was like there's a master here but they don't care you know like uh eh, what was the question? Now I just got on a diatribe that I don't even know. What the, 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 you know, the stigma of playing an instrument correctly. Oh, yeah, you know? so correctly. That's correct. Oh, I don't yeah. want to be correct. Like, if that's what correct is, I don't want to, be, I don't want to have anything to do with correctness. Right. Um, Mark Reuter, I think it's Reuter, I, uh, is asking, are you using G tuning? G, open mm -hmm. G tuning. That's a good question. So um, these are all good questions. Thank you, Julia and Mark. Uh, 
Yeah, I was in B minor, but uh, G over B minor is like a, a six, right? So I've got the six, and then over an F sharp, it is a uh, it's a uh, minor second. Crazy, right? So mm -hmm. these the, the open string. Uh, this like miracle of banjo and yanera music we we are always flabbergasted by how well the banjo just naturally works for the keys the, the the tunings that they use b minor would just leave that g open and go to town baby because it's either you know like <laughs> it somehow just works and it sounds really cool for these chord extensions that they would they would use in yanera music um and yeah but I, i'm using uh g tunings uh on everything we play Okay. To, in this podcast or in this on this live stream cool makes it easy um do y'all want to play another tune sure how many are we yeah. going to do in total? we're going to do three or four about three so we're about the halfway yeah. point so we could okay. do one and then we'll do yeah we'll, get, we'll do an we'll do a example come on ah but some Sí, Yo creo que va a ser caballo viejo para cantar y hacer uno cantado. Si sí, puede ser. Y si, si hay tiempo, volvemos a un poquito café. ¿Qué te parece? Vale. We're having an internal conversation. So, uh, yeah, this is called uh, Los Doce. And it's uh, typically played on mandolin. Okay. Okay, here we go.
Yeah. All right. Bravo. <laughs> Yeah. That's, 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 that's a bambuco. It's a Colombian. Colombian. Come on. Colombian. Colombiano, no? It's a bambuco Colombiano from Colombia, but it's filtered through the Joropo Oriental uh, Venezuela. Venezuelan uh, Eastern tradition. So that, that, esa no es música llanera. No, no es música oriental. That's a Eastern, por... Eastern uh, Venezuelan music kind of transformed by this notable. Uh, this incredible group called Ensemble Gurufio. Uh, Te Hurtado is a very known cuatrista, cuatro player that uh, is part of that group. And uh, they've, eh, ¿cómo se llama el mandolinista que te cuento? Bueno, apellido Soto, no recuerdo el nombre. Soto, there's a great mandolinist in that group. And they've also, they also did an, uh, a, a disc with uh, Hamilton de Holanda. Hamilton de Holanda. También Hamilton de Holanda. Sí. Hamilton is pretty known in the States because he collaborated with Mike Marshall. Um, anyway, that tradition is like shared between Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil. It's like Choro. Those melodies and this kind of like mandolin-oriented music is also played in Venezuela. So that was kind of like reminiscent of, of, of that whole thing. And th said. those melodies, there's not a lot of improvisation going on a little bit on on the accents of the melody but you're essentially playing yeah it's music. it's kind of it's kind of well there's subtle improvisation going on right. but yeah it's mostly uh the melody you know the melody itself is it, it is it's so beautiful um that it, it's kind of nice to just to play there is more improvisation in the first song that we did there's more room yeah. for improvisation there though like guys like hamilton de holanda like they improvise like stuff that you know i i hope I'll take more risks on that. I'm taking subtle improvisational risks, but not not too much on that stuff yet. Yeah, I saw like when you went up the neck a high and did like a, a sort of yeah, general. like I throw in the little banjoy stuff because you know I'm a banjo player. I like a little banjo. <laughs> stuff. So I was thinking I was as I was playing that song, I had the like in my ear like you're using your middle and your index a lot on this one. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's contrary to everything I've told you uh <laughs> that particular song is, is kind of hard to do that i do keep it mostly to thumb and index though uh -huh. but i do i do throw the, the middle in there a little bit so i actually tried to avoid it in one moment and then i messed up a phrase and i was like i oh, know i'll just stick to the way i usually do this because i know banjo players are watching this and they're like he's lie he's a liar he's a hypocrite <laughs> Yeah, it definitely had that sounded similar to to Brazilian shore music. I could hear that that relationship there. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mark Reuter is 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 saying how your tremolo <laughs> with your thumb uh, looks that tremolo with his thumb though. Um, yeah. Well. Uh, so yeah. Uh, yeah. I, oh yeah. I can't really do that. I do have discovered like a tremolo with the fat of my ring finger that. I and I get some of the, that. It's a really pretty tremolo. Speaking yeah. of tremolo. Yeah. We That's have, funny, uh, Mark. <laughs> Kyla. Who I think you might know. Um, seems, Our manager, Kayla. <laughs> seems like Larry plays everything. Um, but he has <laughs> never played the band. Parece que Larry se toca todo. He does. He's a talented guy. He plays the bass too, but we don't have it out. What, what does he play? Does he play three finger or, or, or claw? He plays or upright or? bass. And he also plays electric bass and a salsa bass, which is like a Brady uh, salsa bass. Larry can do it all. He doesn't, his maracas are in the car, so he won't play that. And plus, that wouldn't work. That would destroy oh, the mic. Funny enough. Yeah, it's it's rough for this. All you'd hear was. Tss, tss, tss. You have to come to a live show if you want to see us do all that stuff. Yeah, you. everybody definitely should, you know. Um, when you played at, uh, at Blue Ridge at the, um, the, the, the concert there, that was fantastic. Um, Larry, what do you like about the banjo and traditional Appalachian music? ¿Qué te gusta del banjo y de la música tradicional de los Apalaches? Me encanta um, la diferencia que hay entre entre mi música y la música del bluegrass. I love the difference that there is between my music and and bluegrass. Uh, 
Utilizar muchas séptimas, novenas. Yeah, using a lot of sevenths and ninths. Es bastante divertido. It's really fun listening to that, he said. Uh, y, y lo más, lo que más me llama la atención del Bluegrass es que cuando miras a una agrupación tocando, digo de los festivales, estar en un festival, es algo muy genuino. El patrón es, digamos, cuadrado, pero el que va a tocar en ese jam puede salirse de ese, de ese cuadro y hacer lo que quiera. Yeah, what he's talking about is when you're at like outdoor music festivals or fiddlers conventions, these big bluegrass festivals, you'll see uh, like a bluegrass band kind of play more out of the box uh, in a jam uh, scenario. You know, there's like there, there's a standard for songs and whatnot, but he, he's remarking how it's, it's so awesome to see so many groups give their own little uh, contribution to ¿verdad? Que cada uno tiene su aporte. Cada quien da su aporte. Everyone's got their contribution to the to the style. Sí. That's what's so cool about bluegrass, man. We we feel the same way with fun. And música llanera. Every group is going to have, you know, it's different human beings. Mm -hmm. They're all going to bring some sort of special sound that only their bodies through their fingers will make in that in that group of people together. It's such a it's a it's such a humanistic uh, es como muy bien de humano, ¿no? Como tú mezclas cuatro o cinco humanos. Es más corazón que otra cosa. Yeah, it's like a matter of the heart. It's kind of es, like a heart thing. Es allí donde se, se, se puede comprobar que el pentagrama queda muy chiquitito. Mm, ajá. Porque la gente desarrolla según lo que quiere expresar. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, in, in those situations, you just realize that uh, reading music that uh, written and read music uh, just is not enough because it's in those situations that you'll just see the art of spontaneous expression. Uh, mm. that, that's a similarity between, you know, Appalachian music, like at a jam, like the, the jams, yeah. Musica Llanera, it's just, it's a lot like old time music, mm -hmm. honestly. Bluegrass is a little more limited in, to, you know, they'll pass around solos, but uh, Llanera music, Llanera, la música llanera es más parecido al old time que el bluegrass. Mm -hmm. ¿no? Porque sí. la, la, tiene la, apertura. It, pero, pero es muy similar al bluegrass con respecto al estilo de grabación y ese tipo de cosas. Ah, sí, sí. sí. Yeah, we're, talk, we're talking about how, like, in some way, like, música llanera might be a little bit more old time oriented. Uh -huh. Because it is like, uh, like a melody centric or a groove center centric uh, repetitive vibe and it can go on and on and on and on and it's uh it's like an enchantment right um but it, it's very similar to the bluegrass music industry like with the you know all the vintage photos and like vinyl and people selling like tapes out of their car and uh just the general like aesthetic and vibe of it is, is a similar musical culture um uh, for any bluegrass musician who thinks they're alone in the world and that only bluegrass has this kind of like festival scene it's it's not that's not the case they do the same thing in venezuela but with you know it's different Instead of like camping out in a field, they will people will open up their homes or rent out their homes, and it's kind of more like a city oriented uh, or town oriented thing. They'll like take over a town for a music festival, but similar, mm -hmm. it's very similar. In, in uh, a lot of ways. Y, y gracias a esto, gracias a este nuevo proyecto de Larry and Joe, Venezuela está conociendo lo que en realidad es el bluegrass. Yeah, and th through our uh, little project larry and joe uh, people in venezuela are learning what bluegrass is too you know it goes both ways uh everyone uh, musica de película. yeah yeah the, the, the past is just like <laughs> the, the idea for them is like something they've seen in the movies and mistakenly they think it's from the wild wild west <laughs> yeah they think it's like uh it's like somebody on the plains riding a horse uh, Right. He, he even yeah, and Larry didn't even realize until we started <laughs> hanging out last year that bluegrass is from this region, right. and that uh, it it's it's like a the 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 propagation of like of of the stereotype internationally is that it's cowboy music, and yeah, yeah. I've never seen a tumbleweed in North Carolina, but uh, I don't, <laughs> nor is it arid yet. We'll have to wait 40 years, and then I'm sure it will be, like everywhere else. But... Larry, did you know what a banjo was when you lived in, Cal in, in, in Venezuela? And, and 
Did you ever think you'd be playing with a banjo player? Tú sabías lo que lo que era un banjo cuando vivías en Venezuela y en algún momento pensaste que ibas a terminar tocando con un banjo? No, jamás me dio un banjo. No, never. I've never, I've never, I've never, I've never seen, he said, I've never seen a banjo. Incluso en las películas no lo muestra. Actually, in the in the movies that they, they don't show them, so I've never seen one. Conocemos la palabra apalache. They know apache solo por las películas. So he, they know the word apache in the in in movies, but it has nothing to do, of course, with apalache. So they, it's a completely remote concept. It's like for people around here, música llanera. We've never heard of that. I had never heard of that. And I'm sure most people watching this, probably watching this uh, live stream, have never heard of música llanera. But it, it does exist. ¿Y algún, en algún momento pensaste que ibas a terminar tocando con un banjista? No, o sea, precisamente lo que nunca pasó por mi cabeza fue tocar con una persona que no tenía nada que ver con la música llanera. Yeah, he had o never sea, considered or dreamed of playing music with someone who had nothing to do with música llanera. Yeah, like como, he never had crossed through Como el mind. proyecto principal, no, quizás en alguna ocasión. He thought maybe like, at, like on, a, on a special occasion it could have maybe mm -hmm. happened, but not as like a principal project. So, yeah, I think Larry's pretty surprised by this. Pero ocurrió algo happened. muy, muy único. La conexión que hubo en nuestra primera vez de arpa y banjo fue algo que no solo a nosotros nos gustó y nos impactó, sino que impactó al público. Yeah, he's talking about how uh, something really special happened the first time we ever put the banjo and the harp together. Uh, it wasn't just special to us. We realized it was it was cool, but uh, the audience that was there, that residency that we were doing in Durham, they were over the moon with the combination. And they were like, wow, this is, this is cool. Banjo and harp. Whoa, because on the surface, even I would have felt that's that's like banjo and piano, like they're uh, quick decay oh, yeah, yeah. sounds. Like there's that's not gonna work, right? But then it, yeah. it it actually does somehow work, and they fold into each other in a way that sometimes we'll listen back to a recording of ourselves and we'll be like, wait, was that was that me or was that you? Whoa, that's weird. It kind of trips you out. Like it sounds like a banjo, and vice versa. This sounds like a harp. So it's interesting to have a duo where the, uh, you know, of course we, we we play different instruments in this duo. I also play the fiddle and the guitar and the harmonica sometimes, and Larry plays the upright bass, the cuatro, and the maracas, and whatever else he wants to play. And so, you know, we do a gamut of, of stuff, but like the, the, the plato fuerte, the main dish is banjo and harp, and uh, it, it has a lot of potential, we're finding, and we're still exploring that, you know, as we're deciphering each other's vocabularies and figuring it out. We've only been playing music together for like 10 months. Yeah. So still getting it together, you know? And Larry, were you not playing music professionally in the, in the U S um, before you met Joe? Hasta conocerme a mí, estabas tocando la música profesionalmente en Estados Unidos. Estaba trabajando música latina. He was working in Latin, Latin American music. Uh, orquesta de salsa, una banda que fue mi proyecto base. Some uh, salsa orchestras and one of his uh, principal projects was... Sí. Música latina con arpa, uh, salsa merengue, cumbia. Yeah, salsa ah. merengue, cumbia. He has a group called Son Latinos. Mm -hmm. with some friends from North Carolina playing uh, a variety of Latin American musical styles. Pero trabajando Pero construcción. trabajando construcción. Yeah, he was, he was always working in construction. Yeah. And he's currently transitioning out of that because our duo, we're going to be able to live off of this soon. That's awesome. That's really yeah. awesome. Que ver que estamos en transición para vivir netamente de esto. Yes. Sí, y, y para mí ha sido una gran bendición porque después de estar 25 años, 26 años en Venezuela trabajando con la música a nivel profesional, como maestro, como músico, como cantante, a llegar acá y cambiar el switch y trabajar solo construcción fue bastante fuerte. Yeah, after 25 or 26 years living and working as a musician exclusively, whether teaching or performing, uh, it was, you know, coming to the United States and all of a sudden having to work in construction was like turning on a switch that was 
he was really difficult to deal with, really difficult to accept. Yeah. So, yeah, he's been through it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's been through a lot of pain and uh, suffering because 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 of this, but having to, you know, he's a political asylum seeker. He's an asylum seeker here in the States. When they talk about Venezuelan asylum seekers, they're talking about my buddy. You know, it's not just you can put a here's a chance to put a face with a name. But he said, but he's saying it was it was worth it. It was it was worth it. Es bastante este confortante que lo que he conocido del Bluegrass, del Old Time, a través de los festivales que he ido con Joe, a las universidades, a, a, pues me ha llenado mucho de, otra, de otros colores de la música, que no solamente los oigo, sino que también sin querer se van mezclando con la música venezolana. He says he's comforted by what's happening as a result of visiting music festivals, uh, going as a duo to all these music festivals and fiddlers conventions and universities and whatnot, uh, that, he, that he's starting to be enriched by more musical colors and, um, you know, uh, textures and, and whatnot. It's in, it, all of this is, is enriching his life. Sin querer pasa lo que le pasa a Nelson, lo que le hizo Nelson. Eh, sin querer llevo el bluegrass a la música. Yeah, Nelson. without even really trying to, uh, he's going to take that, that. That's just kind of impacting his Llanera music, his experience mm -hmm. with bluegrass. In the same way that Victor Wooten's playing impacted Nelson Echandia. You know, it just kind of like enters in there. Yeah. Sí, yeah. Bueno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it uh, sneaks in. That's what he's saying. Right. It just it just makes a you know richer you know richer recipe. That you totally. Right. And and Joe, you've been able to like use traditional music to highlight issues that you care about throughout you know throughout a lot of your career. Um, when did you realize you could kind of contemporize this traditional music and 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 in this way? Well, I think traditional music has always been contemporary in the first place. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's music and it's happening now. Uh, I don't think of traditional music as any less contemporary than electronic music or anything that's being explored because it is as contemporary. I mean, the, the instruments that we're playing are made with more uh, contemporary machines and the industry which surrounds traditional music is contemporary. This idea that traditional music is like a vestige of the past or something is completely, in, in, as far as I can say, it's 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 not true. And and mm -hmm. also, traditional music isn't. Uh, we we aren't living the kind of lives that uh, Bill Monroe or Earl, Earl Scruggs led. There's the world has changed. Everything anyway. So. You know, I, I just I play this music and uh, I have an interest in I would like to see change. I, I, I'm not a I'm not a politician, nor am I political kind of disinterested with the political machine, honestly. Uh, but I think uh, it's important to say what you think, like immigration reform is important. Why? Because it's the system is screwing over my friend and my mm -hmm. friends and all kinds of people. And that screws up things for everyone, for me on a personal level. It, it, I, I, I wish I could wish it away. There's nothing. I, I also I, I say what I feel should be said. You know, that's that's just what I do. I, I don't think of it as anything special. It's just, uh, I write songs in recent years. I've been writing songs about other people, which is a process that I, I love. I, I'm really, uh, it's been a blessing to be able to write songs about Moises Serrano and Dream Caldwell and Leonard Peltier, um, to be inspired by, by people. Uh, I wrote a song called Hermano Migrante in solidarity with migrants in the United States. And that's the first song of mine that Larry heard, which compelled him to play with me. So had I not written songs for social justice, 
I wouldn't have even met, you know, one of my best friends and, and my and, and the person that I'm going to be working with uh, in this whole next chapter of my life. You know, it's going to be our principal project. That's what we're doing. If anyone's wondering if, if we're serious about this, well, this is our this is our livelihood and this is what we're doing. Larry and Joe, ¿verdad que esto es nuestra, nuestro trabajo? Sí. <laughs> This is our work. Este es plato fuerte. This is our main dish. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will continue to, to, to talk about uh, immigration reform because I think he, you know, you know, he's a, he's an asylum seeker. He's got, um, you know, I, 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 I think this country is uh, lucky to have all these incredible immigrants in it. And uh, it goes right back to the foundation of this country. Like, where are we? Well, whose land are we on? You know, this is a. Uh, th there were people here before Euro Europeans got here. There's a whole lot of healing that needs to be done, and uh, we need to consider the reality of the situation and not be hypocritical, not exclude people when we ourselves, uh, speaking for white people here, uh, are the descendants of immigrants. You know. Um, so anyway, that's that's that. Well, we definitely want y'all to keep it going because the, the the music is the music is fantastic and uh thank you, you know, Dave. I definitely you hope it hope it can you know grow where you can do this you know 100 percent full time yeah and, help uh, us do it help us do it you know like y'all just if you if you've got things that we can do uh contact our manager our angel kayla and uh let's we'll come to a city near you we're on the road. We're going to be all over the United States next year, coast to coast on many occasions. So just be, be in touch, reach out, help us figure out where, where we need to be playing in, in your town. That's how it works. That's literally how it works. Just uh, if you got an idea, run it, run it by our manager. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll see if we can't get that way. Yeah, and he's saying, yeah, make sure to he's we're watching the website intermittently appear. Y'all can y'all can find all that contact information on our website, larryandjoe.com. It's not to be confused with Larry and Joe's Pizzeria, Newark, New Jersey, and uh and actually uh, uh Jersey City on Newark Avenue. Uh that's not us. That's not us. Well, um, yeah, and you also have that that single dropping tomorrow, right? Yeah, I'm like cool. Ah, we could actually, yeah, we could do that one too. Yeah, we're we're kind of at the top of the hour, so it's um, you know, uh, if you could play us out, and if you want to play us out with that that tune that's coming out tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Out. Yeah, I'll just have to retune because I do this. Sure. You know, I do the capo, and you know, banjo players, when you put a capo on a banjo, you're gonna have to retune a little bit. No matter how good of a banjo it is. This is, by the way, this beautiful Hamlet banjo. Look at that inlay. John Hamlet is the most brilliant uh, banjo luthier and a wonderful friend. His guitars and mandolins and banjos are, Yeah, he's an innovator. He's really an innovator. And uh, Lizzie Ross, the incredible artist Lizzie Ross and musician from uh, Violet Bell, she did the inlay design and John then cut it out of abalone and uh mother of pearl put it on banjos this is the three sisters crop uh which was an idea that lizzie had of corn beans and squash so there's your little banjo uh eye candy moment that's awesome thanks both of you for being on the show this was, this was really good um thanks everybody for coming and next week be sure to tune in because we have the uh steve martin award uh, thursday song, uh, most recorded Venezuelan song in history. It's by Simon Diaz and it's Caballo Viejo. All right. One second. Play again.
llega así de esta manera, como no se dan en cuenta. El carotar verde es como el manchito florece y la sombra se revienta. Cuando el amor llega así de esta manera, como no se dan en cuenta. Caballo de danza, que está viejo y cansado, pero no se da de cuenta que el corazón para cuando le sueltan las riendas es caballo de boca. Y si una bota la sana, caballo viejo se encuentra, el pecho se le dejará no hay más que y no lo le desafreno ni lo para en falsa rienda. Thank <laughs> you.